Medicine of the Polytechnic University of the Marche Region, in collaboration with the Lab of Molecular Archaeoanthropology of the University of Camerino in Italy. I talk about the DNA profiling from the decay of human bones. Ma'am, you're not audible. We cannot hear you. Hello? Hello? Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, can now we can Okay, okay. Yeah, we can hear Okay, uh, did you see the, um, can you see my presentation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 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 Ancient remains, as well as biological evidences collected at crime scenes, are usually exposed to the environmental factors that may affect the DNA integrity, degrading the genetic materials uh, to a small average size. Actually, the DNA preservation in particular materials, such as bones, soft tissues from mummies, coprolites, feet, and so on, is not necessarily correlated with the age of the sample. The environment is an important factor for the preservation of DNA. The main physical, chemical, and biological factors affecting the DNA degradation are microorganisms, UV radiation, oxygen, water, aridity, temperature, pH, and the presence in the soil of quartz, feldspar, and clay, minerals, and organic compounds such as humic acid. So, the best conditions for DNA preservation are cool dry, anaerobic, and with a neutral pH environment. These are the best conditions to um, make the DNA clean. The main causes of uh, um, DNA damage are the DNA hydrolysis that can cause the baseless sites, and the effect could be the um, polymerase enzymes that the extension block of the polymerase enzymes. It can also cause the strand breaks, such as the DNA fragmentation, and the consequence are that the few molecules can be used as templates for PCR. The DNA hydrolysis uh, in as associated with the DNA oxidation can also cause the modified bases or also called miscoding lesions. These are the incorporation of erroneous bases during PCR. There are two types of nucleotide misincorporation, type 1 and type 2. The type 1 is the substitution of hardening with guanine and timing with cytosine. And the type 2 is the substitution of cytosine with thymine and the guanine with the adenine. Another cause could be the UV radiation that can cause crosslinks um, that produce the artifact sequence and the timing dimers that can cause the uh, chimera sequences through the jumping PCR. So DNA damage limits the size of the surviving DNA to about 100-500 base a pair. And, uh, but the majority of ancient DNA damage is reflected by type 2. Uh, there are some methodical problems in ancient DNA studies. First of all, the small quantity and the small size of DNA fragments. A uh, low copy number is defined as less than 100 picogram of template. It results. Oh, sorry. It results in a lack of amplification of some DNA fragments. Uh, 
This problem can be solved by increasing the number of PCR amplification cycles, reducing the amplification volume, or increasing the DNA polymerase quantity, or choosing the mitochondrial DNA due to its higher copy number instead of the nuclear DNA. The second problem could be the presence of inhibitors. These are um, substances such as fulvic acid, free radicals, bulk salts, tobacco, urea, collagen, ethanol, and so on, that interfere, could interfere with the cell lysis necessary for DNA extraction, nucleic acid denaturation, or a capture, and with the polymerase activity, thus preventing enzymatic amplification of the target DNA. The genomic DNA template may be diluted, which also dilutes the PCR inhibitor, and the template is amplified again in the presence of less inhibitor. Or more DNA polymerase can be added to overcome the inhibitor. The third problem could be the contamination, that could be innate and external. The innate contamination within the sample um, prior to the lab analysis, such as the presence of human cells, environmental bacteria, and so on. And external contamination is the contamination in the sample as a result of careless laboratory practice. Um, this is due, for example, by um, people who are working in the lab and they can contaminate the samples. So, in order to avoid the contamination, there are some good laboratory practices that we could follow. Um, in order to ensure the reliability and reproducibility of the results. First of all, everyone who works in the forensic lab must be genotyped through its Aaron Buckles Web in order to have the genetic profile recorded and avoid modern human contamination. Pre- and post-PCR sample processing areas should be separated because uh, there is a room for the DNA extraction analysis, a room for DNA amplification preparation, a room for DNA amplification and a sequencing, and another room for DNA analysis. The PCR lab is designed so that the work of flows through the different processes in one direction, starting with the sample reception and finishing with the post-PCR analysis. Uh, positive hair pressure um, in pre-PCR areas and negative pressure in post-PCR rooms also reduces the possibility of introducing any contamination into the PCR areas. In the pre-PCR lab, there should be a slight positive pressure compared to the hair in the connecting hallway. The post-PCR lab, in contrast, should be at slightly reduced pressure to pull hair in from the outside and thereby prevent escape of amplicons from the completed PCR samples being analyzed inside the lab. These are other um, practices. Um, actually, the samples are passed through uh, small boxes that are present in the labs in order to minimize the possibility of any material being transferred from post-PCR to pre-PCR areas because we have said that the direction is just one from pre-PCR to post-PCR and not the country. The lab clothing, such as gloves, should be without powder because the powder can, could interfere with the TAC DNA polymerase. The facial masks and the hairnet to prevent the skin cells or hair from falling into the amplification tubes must add because they could contaminate the samples. In particular, gloves should be changed very frequently because DNA may splash into gloves when the tops of the tubes are open and the transfer of DNA between the spacements. Equipment such as pipettors and the reagents for setting up PCR should be kept separate from other lab supplies, especially those used for analysis of PCR products. Reaction may be set up in a laminar flow hood 
and the reagent should be carefully prepared to avoid the presence of any contaminating DNA or nucleases. Piper tips should be used and changed and on every new sample to prevent the cross-contamination during liquid transfers. And um, finally, the ultraviolet irradiation of lab PCR setup space when the area is not in use and cleaning the workspaces and instruments with isopropanol and or 10% bleach solutions because this helps to ensure that extraneous DNA molecules are destroyed prior to DNA extraction or PCR setup. Um, DNA typing was first described uh, in 1985 by Alec Jeffries. He found that certain regions of DNA contain DNA sequences that were repeated over and over again next to each other. He also discovered that the number of repeated sequences uh, present in a sample could differ from individual to individual. And these DNA repeat regions became known as the variable number of tandem repeats. These are a type of mini satellite DNA in which the repeated sequence is generally from 10 to 100 base pair. And the number of times the sequence repeats varies among individuals. They are used for identification purpose, but not applicable to highly degraded DNA, since successful profiling requires large amounts of intact DNA. Large amount means about 10, 25 nanogram or 400, 1000 base pair. That is a lot. So these markers cannot be used for our study, for example. So um, these markers were replaced by short tandem repeats that are micro satellite DNA in which the repeated sequences is a general from two to six base pair, so they are shorter. And the number of times the repeats occurs in, uh, is a variable among individuals. Uh, they are uh, also used for identification purpose and they also are better candidates for a highly degraded DNA typing, since in this case, successful profiling requires less amounts of DNA. It means um, 100, 400 base pair could be enough. But for our study, we have used a non-traditional marker that is called single nucleotide polymorphism. This is the variation in a single nucleotide at a specific position in the genome and occurs in a population for at least 1%. It's the best marker for a highly degraded DNA since successful profiling requires less than 100 base pair of DNA. It means that SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, may yield more information from challenging samples due to their smaller amplicon size. Okay, SNPs can be uh, classified in four categories. First of all, we have the identity testing SNPs that could provide the genetic information to differentiate the people and thus exclude individuals that cannot be the source of an evidentiary sample or cannot be a putative family member. There are the SNPs that are lineage informative due to the lack of recombination and the low mutation rate of SNPs that reside on the mitochondrial DNA genome and the Y chromosome. These lineage markers are informative for the tracing human migration patterns or kinship analysis, in particular where reference and unknown samples are separated from by several generations. The most likely forensic use of lineage, lineage SNPs is in missing person cases and mass disaster identifications. Then SNPs could also provide information uh, about the ancestry and, um, and they can also give information about the uh, phenotype um, 
such as uh, skin color, hair color, high color, and so on. They also may be of value in anthropology studies for the facial reconstruction of unknown human remains. Okay, now one of the most important used kits for uh, typing samples with the graded DNA is the Precision ID Panel Kit that allows to analyze 124 SNPs, including 90 autosomal and 34 Y SNPs. It means SNPs that are present on Y chromosome and SNPs. Uh, the autosomal SNPs are the SNPs present in the autosomal chromosomes. The autosomal markers have an average amplicon length of 132 nucleotides and the Y markers are 141 nucleotides in length on average. Okay, now the most promising technology for analyzing genotypes from forensic degraded and challenging samples is the massive parallel sequencing that is also known as next generation sequencing of SNPs. Uh, as shown in the picture. He, uh, this is the instrument that I have used for my research because of these characteristics, because of the high sensitivity, high specificity, high coverage, low cost, fast, and also easy to use. Uh, the two current NGS system now most applicable to forensic analysis are Illumina MySec, and the life technology ion personal genome machine system, that is the instrument shown in the picture. So, which is the purpose of my study? The aim of this study is the evaluation of SNP based forensic identification by the ion PGM system using the precision identity panel kit on the human degraded DNA samples from bone specimens. Okay, in my study, 29 human samples were selected. Uh, five from archeological samples dating from the 6th to 17th century after Christ, and the 24 from human cadavers so during medical legal autopsy. Um, we have used the term uh, archeological to indicate the very, very um, old uh, samples and the term forensic to indicate the more recent samples. Um, the archaeological samples are listed in the little table uh, with their approximate age. As you can see, they are very, very old. And in the taller table, there is the list of forensic samples uh, with their collection here that goes to 9880 to um, 2015. Okay, the first step of my research was the DNA extraction methods. Uh, these samples will, were extracted and um, DNA from the archaeological samples was extracted use, using phenyl chloroform. The bones were cleaned with sandpaper to remove the dirt surface when the specimens were sterilized for one hour under UV radiation. After this, the bones were pulverized with the liquid nitrogen and then subjected to the extraction procedure according to the protocol. DNA from the forensic samples was extracted using phenyl chloroform or PrEP filer BTA forensic DNA extraction kit that is developed for the extraction of DNA from calcified tissue such as bone and uh, tooth. So um, the methods that were used are just two. One was, was the manual extraction that is the phenyl chloroform and another was the automated uh, method with the uh, kit. The second step was the DNA quantization and the degradation index that was performed by the Quantifale Trio DNA Quantification Kit that gives quantitative and qualitative assessment of a total human and also human male DNA. Actually, this kit is able to amplify the three targets, the large autosomal human target, small autosomal human target, and the Y chromosome. Uh, 
um, the ratio between the DNA concentration of small autosomal target and uh, the um, DNA concentration of large autosomal targets determines the degradation index. Results obtained by the degradation index could be classified in the three ranks. Uh, the first ranks is, uh, as you can see in this uh, table, less than one if the DNA is not degraded or inhibited. Between 1 and 10, if the DNA is slightly too moderately degrading, and more greater than 10, if the DNA is highly degraded. Okay, these tables show the results obtained from DNA quantitation. Uh, you can see here the samples in red are those highly degraded, and in blue, are moderately degraded. Um, two moderately degraded and three highly degraded samples were detected in archaeological samples. 13 moderately degraded and 11 highly degraded samples were detected in forensic samples. Remember that the uh, table of forensic samples is the taller and the archaeological sample is the smaller uh, table. Two males were detected in archaeological samples and 14 mates in forensic samples. Uh, it was important to determine also the mates because it will be useful for a further analysis that will be uh, done uh, later. Okay. Mm, regarding the typing results of archaeological samples, only two or five gave positive results with 69 and 38 typed SNPs respectively. Since this was not the expected result, I have diluted the samples in order to test the presence of inhibitors in a pure DNA samples. And um, after that, the replicates gave better results, as you can see uh, from the tables. And the autosomal SNPs positively detected increase at any replicate. So after this dilution, um, just one samples didn't uh, give uh, uh, positive SNPs. So we have confirmed that the presence of inhibitors uh, was the limiting factors in this case, because the presence of inhibitors in pure DNA samples um, has been confirmed by better results obtained with the dilution. It will be not the same for forensic samples, as we will see, because in this case, the limiting factor is the presence of inhibitors. But for forensic samples, um, uh, the limiting factor uh, will be uh, another. Regarding the typing results of forensic samples, we can see that most of them gave a positive results. Only three samples gave negative results. The negative results were the samples in red. As you can see, in this case, zero SNPs have, have been detected. Summarizing the characteristics and the results of a forensic samples, we can notice that samples with low starting DNA quantity and the lower, uh, lower the limit of quantification that are the samples in red, uh, didn't give any SNPs. Samples with the high DNA starting quantity gave between um, 81 and 90 typed SNPs. These are the sample in blue. The only exception was uh, for the first sample in the first line of the table, because even if it was a high starting in a quantity, but only 10 type SNPs were detected. And uh, samples with the starting DNA quantity uh, um, under the limit of quantification, those in purple, gave uh, between 0 and 73 type SNPs. In this case, so regarding the forensic sample, the more recent samples, um, we can notice that the degradation index does not seem interfere with the genotyping performance. And the starting DNA quantity can be the limiting factor. 
Actually, you can see that there are samples uh, highly degraded that gave uh, some type of SNPs and there are the samples moderately degraded, so no highly degraded, with no um, SNPs. So, in this case, uh, we have demonstrated that the different behavior of archaeological and forensic samples, even if we have used the same kit for both. Summarizing all the results, uh, four out of five archaeological samples have been successfully typed, only one gave no type SNPs, and uh, 21 out of 24 forensic samples have been successfully typed, only three gave no type SNPs. Anyway, the results I've obtained were surprising because I did not expect it to be able to get the DNA profiling from a very, very ancient skeletal remains. Actually, as I uh, told before, the bones belong to the 6th, 17th century after Christ. Um, this table is just an example of a, a sample genotyping results, including the position, amplicon size, the genotype, the total coverage, the percentage positive coverage, so all the details of each SNP detected in each sample. We have done this work for all uh, samples analyzed, but in this presentation, I just put um, uh, one sample just for uh, show you an example of the genotyping results. Results obtained from this kind of analysis also allow to calculate the random match probability. The random match probability is the probability that two unrelated individuals randomly chosen from a population have two profiles that match at every locus tested. It's calculated on 85 unlike, unlike, unlinked identity SNPs of the 90 in the panel for a five population. Africa, Europe, America, East Asia, that include China, Japan, Korea, and South Asia, that includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. It has been possible to determine the random match probability for whole samples with the posi positive autosomal SNPs. The SNP profiles of archaeological and forensic bone samples are found to be common in Europe and rare in Africa, uh, as you can see in this table. So it means that the samples uh, are more probably to uh, come from Europe and uh, then South Asia, then America, then East Asia, and last Africa. Okay, moreover, it was also possible to identify the Y half group of samples based on uh, 34 Y SNPs. It means so the random match probability has been calculated thanks to the SNPs present in the autosomal mark, autosomal chromosomes. But the Y hypergroup analysis, it means the phylogenetic analysis, could be calculated by SNPs present on a sexual chromosome. The Y hypergroup analysis has been successfully performed in only one archaeological sample, given that only in this sample was it possible to detect the SNPs on Y chromosomes. Results show this um, archaeological sample belongs to the haplogroup L that is defined by the mutation M20 and is found in South Asia, Central Asia, Southwest Asia and the Mediter Mediterranean. Uh, regarding the forensic samples, uh, um, 15 out of 24 forensic samples were males, and these were assigned to four upper groups. The most represented Y upper group is J, assigned to eight samples. J upper group evolved in the ancient Near East and spread from there during the Neolithic into North Africa, Europe, Central Asia, Pakistan, and India. Then four samples shared the haplogroup R1b, 
uh, that is defined by the SNP M207. It's believed to have arisen um, 27,000 years ago in Asia, but now it is very diffused in uh, among modern populations. Two samples were assigned to the haplogroup G. The haplogroup G is uh, commonly found in Western Asia, Central Asia, and Europe. Just one sample was attributed to the haplogroup F. Uh, that is also known as FM89. It's a very common Y chromosome haplogroup. The clade and the subclades constitute over 90% of paternal lineage outside from Africa. So, uh, in this study, we have evaluated the precision identity panel kit for human identification in a highly degraded samples using the PGM system. Massive parallel sequencing is a technique able to produce a lot of DNA sequence data in a high throughput way. And the panels of SNP markers allow the amplification of small DNA fragments, often found in skeletal samples from forensic and archeological context. The, ge the generation of a DNA profile from a bond remains is an important part of uh, identification process in unidentified person cases. So, in general, in conclusion, our results uh, show that the massively parallel sequencing of 124 SNPs included in the precision ID panel typing is an effective tool for human identification hands in compromised samples by DNA degradation. Our results also show the possibility to genotype archaeological samples dating from the 6th to 17th century after Christ. The limiting factor in the analysis of archaeological bone samples is not the degradation index nor the starting DNA quantity, but the presence of inhibitors. On the contrary, the limiting factor in the analysis of the forensic bone samples is the starting DNA quantity. More study, but more study should be conducted to improve the efficiency of this technique. In particular, it's necessary to evaluate the impact of different extraction methods to remove the PCR inhibitors, commonly found in human remains, and their compatibility with the downstream technology. I'd like to conclude with this sentence. DNA testing is to justice what the telescope is for the stars, not a lesson in biochemistry, not a display of the wonders of magnifying glass, but a way to see things as they really are. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, anyone uh, want to ask any kind of question related to the uh, presentation? Okay, ma'am, there is one question uh, I want to ask. Uh, what is SNPs? What is Ma'am, what is a short nucleotide polymorphism? Ah, okay. It's, uh, okay. it's a genetic marker. It's a genetic marker. Okay. And it's just a variation. It's just a variation in one single nucleotide. So it's the variation in just one base of the DNA. It means it can be very, very useful for the typing of highly degraded DNA because in this case, we require less amount of DNA to uh, obtain a, a profile. Okay. Because, yes, we, we, we need a less amount of DNA. So for this reason, if we have uh, highly degraded samples, we cannot use a short tandem repeats because they are longer and they need more DNA. Okay. Thank okay. you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're uh, calm. You're calm. Okay. Anyone uh, can like, ask any type of questions? So, 
so actually no one want to ask hello hello uh, am i audible okay. yeah you are audible yeah. okay uh, so i just wanted to know ki uh, snp it is is it unique with every individual i don't think so is it or is it uh, it belongs to a group of people having the same snp snp sorry as in as in the ma'am it's a short tandem p no short nucleotide polymorphism. polymorphism yeah my bad my bad yeah 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 okay <laughs> yes but but short tandem repeats are still the most used in gen in forensic genetics but not when we have a highly degraded samples the short tandem repeats remain the best markers for the identification for identification purpose for example yes but if you have a degraded samples the best candidates are the uh, snips are single nucleotide polymorphism and the single nucleotide polymorphism uh, does it change from every individual as in is it the same yes. for a group of individual or uh, yeah yes sure yes sure because all the repeat units are different and the number of the repeated sequences changes uh from individuals to individuals and thanks to this it's possible to determine the person to identify a person yes oh, okay thank you you can just wanted to know that okay you can any more questions so no one want to ask like i actually every like clear by your presentations and uh, any kind of doubt they i don't so they uh, they have any kind of doubt so thank you so much ma'am for your valuable informative session thank you thank you to you okay. now uh, our second expert is the keynote speaker is miss desiree david she is a lecturer in the department of criminal and procedural law nelson mandela university south africa she is also attorney of the high court of south africa now i request ms david ma'am to continue the conference by sharing your expertise on the concerned topic okay um thank you very much for this invitation um can everyone hear me yes ma'am okay before i start i just want to find out um the participants today are they students or students and professionals ma'am actually uh, in this there is a mix of like like students uh, and professionals too okay thank you very much okay thank you ma'am All right. So yes, thank you very very much for this invitation. Um, I apologize that I don't have a PowerPoint for you, but I'm um, I came to Nepal on a holiday um, in March, and I because it was a holiday, I didn't bring my laptop with me. So I've been caught here during the lockdown, unable to get back to South Africa, and I'm just trying to. Um, do the best i can using my cell phone ma'am it's okay it's totally okay if you don't have any uh, like presentation you can share your views your uh, like expertise with us uh, it's no need to have presentations always okay thank you, thank you. so um uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself um um as it was mentioned i am a, an attorney of the high court of south africa with um experience in criminal cases in criminal procedure um i've also been um a lecturer in the department of criminal and procedural law and i lecture in or my field of expertise is the law of evidence um forensic evidence i teach medical law medical malpractice and health law as well as um legal practice 
Um, in addition, I'm a um, director of our school for law, uh, legal practice, as well as the South African Medical Legal Association. Um, I do work in medical malpractice litigation and um, mediation, as well as um, a lot of training for um, members of the police, the prosecution services, defense attorneys, um, NGOs, and, and so on. Um, specifically with issues relating to evidence and court practice and so on. So that just gives you a little bit of an indication of where um, my expertise is. Um, I often joke that I chose to be a lawyer because I couldn't type and I was really bad at math and science and biology. And it's quite ironic that I end up in a job that requires me to go back to that. But like most lawyers who are involved in the criminal justice system, especially when you are dealing with issues of DNA and so on, um, even though we may not have that expertise, we always have you, the forensic experts and the forensic scientists to confer with, to consult with, to assist us in dealing with our cases in court. And so, um, your value in the criminal justice, the justice system um, is really high because um, the lawyers would tend to make use of your expertise and your advice um, in areas where we would not necessarily have that expertise. So with regard to um, the talk today, um, I just want to give you an overall um, indication of the use of DNA in the criminal justice system. Um, specifically, um, and, I'm, and I'm drawing on the experience that we have in the South African courts. Um, for those of you who know about um, a little bit about South Africa, you know that we have a very, very low crime rate in South Africa. Um, a lot of the crime is violent crime. We have quite a high rate of murder and we have a very, very high rate of rape in South Africa. And so um, in these type of cases specifically, but you know, also less violent crimes like housebreaking and so on, um, DNA evidence has become more and more valuable in the um, criminal justice system in the criminal trial. And over the course of the last 20 years or so, you find that our courts are relying more and more on the use of DNA evidence um, um, in order to um, um, uh, come to a judgment in those type of, uh, those type of cases. So, um, um, obviously, um, when you are dealing with, um, ex, um, with um, DNA evidence, the general rule in South Africa is that DNA is admissible in court proceedings if it is relevant. So in order for um, DNA evidence to be introduced into the criminal trial, the prosecutor has to establish that the DNA evidence is relevant in order for it to be admissible. And once that evidence is admissible, it requires the testimony of an expert, um, a qualified expert in that field in order to place the evidence um, before the court. Now the DNA evidence in South Africa may be placed before the court either by means of an affidavit um, that the expert who's analyzed the DNA evidence um, um, deposes to, or it can be in the form of oral evidence where you are called upon to give oral or verbal testimony in court proceedings when you then will be subject to cross-examination um, um, in order for your testimony regarding the DNA evidence to be placed um, before um, the, um, the court. And the whole reason why um, expert testimony in most jurisdictions is required is because um, the expert in that field has a lot more 
um, knowledge and expertise on certain matters like scientific matters with regard to DNA, um, statistics, ballistics, medical issues, accounting issues, and so on. So these would be some of the types of cases where the testimony of experts is required because um, the understanding is that the court, the judge who is presiding in the case, does not necessarily have the expertise that is required when it comes to um, interpreting or um, giving an opinion on, of those kind of, of matters. And so the expert, which is what you are in your particular field, is then required to come to court and to explain in a manner that makes it possible for a presiding officer to properly understand and in appreciate the intricacies of that particular area of science, how it should affect or what impact it has on the matter that the court is hearing. So in the um, um, criminal justice system, um, DNA evidence obviously is a very, very valuable tool when it comes to um, identification. However, um, and this is something I struggle to make my students understand a lot of times, is that the mere presence of the DNA person, uh, DNA, uh, the mere presence of a person's DNA at a crime scene or on the body of the victim or on uh, a piece of evidence that's found in close proximity to the crime scene, the mere presence of DNA is not necessarily an indication that the individual is actually responsible for having committed that crime. Um, there are a lot of reasons why the person's DNA may be present at the scene of the crime. So it's very, very important um, before the matter actually goes to trial that during the investigation process, that a proper investigation is done so that the police, for example, who are in charge or involved in the investigation do not develop tunnel vision when it comes to um, pursuing one line of investigation and um, um, ignoring any other potential avenues that need to be investigated. We had a very high profile case in South Africa um, a few years ago where a young woman was um, murdered in her apartment and the police in their investigation um, focused completely on the boyfriend of the young woman who had been um, murdered. Um, all the investigation took them, uh, or th they pursued no other line of investigation, just um, the, the um, investigation of the boyfriend. And on the body of the woman was a, partic uh, a particular bite mark. So there was a bite mark that was found on the body of the woman. And um, if um, you know anything uh, about these kind of crimes, um, very often, if there's been a sexual assault involved, for example, bite marks are from the perpetrator um, are found on the body of the victim. But what the police failed to do in the investigation of this crime is that they failed to document the bite mark and they failed to take a swab or a sample, um, um, a DNA, failed to swab a DNA sample off the bite mark, which may have yielded a DNA match with someone other than the um, accused in that kind of situation. Um, so, you know, that gives you some kind um, um, of indication why DNA um, in the course of an investigation um, should not necessarily be treated as the be all and end all. Um, because there may be other um, factors that uh, or investigation may reveal that there are other reasons why a person's DNA was found at the scene of the crime or not found at the scene of the crime, um, as the case may be. So um, in South Africa and in a number of other jurisdictions as well, DNA is treated as circumstantial evidence. And you guys are the experts at this. So you will understand why 
um, DNA in and of itself cannot be treated as conclusive evidence because there are so many reasons why a person's DNA may be found at the scene of crime, especially if you take into consideration aspects of touch DNA and so on. You know, there could be a whole number of reasons why a person's DNA may be found at the scene of the crime, on the body of the victim, or on some item that was found at the scene of the crime. And so it is treated as circumstantial evidence. Now, when a court has to make a determination on circumstantial evidence, what the judge actually does is that he's got to look at the circumstantial evidence. In our case, the DNA evidence that was found at the scene of the crime. And he's got to evaluate the DNA evidence together with all the other evidence that is presented in that case. So yes, the DNA evidence may show that um, a specific person, let's call him X, that X came into contact with the victim of a crime or that X was in close proximity of the victim of the crime. But because the DNA evidence is circumstantial in nature, in other words, it does not direct, directly link Mr. X to having committed the crime. Because if a person was stabbed to death, right? And if, um, let's say, the DNA evidence of um, the boyfriend of the deceased person was found on the body of the deceased person. That does not necessarily mean that he was guilty of having stabbed the victim. All that it indicates is that sometime or the other, he was in contact with the victim, that he had deposited his DNA on the victim. And if they were involved in the relationship, in a relationship, you can understand why, um, why that would be. So it would be very short-sighted for a court to conclude in the absence of any other evidence that Mr. X is responsible for the death of his girlfriend. If there was other evidence that gives you in, that, that shows that Mr. X killed his girlfriend, so for example, if his fingerprints are on the knife that was used to stab the victim, or if um you have an eyewitness who witnessed the actual stabbing attack take place and so on. Yes, then it would be a different story. But the DNA in, it, um, uh, um, in itself is insufficient because it is circumstantial in nature. So what, um, um, when a court is evaluating this kind of evidence, um, if the court is going to draw an inference or come to a conclusion that uh, Mr. X, in our example, was guilty of the crime of murder, then the inference that the court is drawing must be consistent with all the proven facts in that case. In other words, all the evidence weighed up together, including the DNA evidence, must show that. Um, um, that Mr. X was guilty of having done it. If the evidence altogether does not show that he was the person that did it, then the court cannot draw the inference or cannot come to the conclusion based on the DNA evidence itself that Mr. X had done it. So when dealing with circumstantial evidence like DNA, the inference that the court that the judge is going to draw. In other words, the inference that Mr. X, in our example, was guilty of stabbing and murdering his girlfriend, it must include every other inference. In other words, there must be no other inference, there must be no other conclusion that can be drawn in, in, in the facts before the case. So um, there was a case um, um, where um, um, a guy an acu uh, a guy was accused of raping a woman and he was charged with the um, um, with, uh, with rape and so um, at his trial he actually indicated that hang on a sec I have a twin brother an identical twin brother 
um, the DNA was co collected at the scene of the crime. Um, the DNA matched the accused in that particular situation. Um, he was prosecuted and the defense um, um, put out the defense that, look, the accused has a twin brother, an identical twin brother. Um, and so um, it could be the twin brother that was responsible for the rape. Now, coming back to what I said a few minutes ago, that the inference or the conclusion that you are drawing must be the only conclusion in that situation, okay? Clearly in this situation, um, the inference could be that it could have been the accused or it could have been the um, twin brother that could have been responsible for the rape. The prosecution dropped the ball in that particular case because um, they didn't investigate any further. So they could, for example, have used um, fingerprint evidence because even identical twins have different um, fingerprints. So even if the DNA profile would have been exactly the same for both twin brothers, if they had lifted a fingerprint and if they had compared fingerprints, for example, it would have said you could have established with certainty, for example, that yes, the brothers have identical or have the same DNA profile, but the fingerprint that was lifted at the scene of the crime actually shows that it was the accused and not somebody else. So what happened in this particular case is that the prosecution failed to pursue any other line of investigation. So they didn't do their homework properly. Um, what transpired after the gentleman was acquitted, um, found not guilty of rape, is that the twin brother um, was actually out of the jurisdiction of the court in a different country. So he could not necessarily, he could not possibly have been committing the crime um, on the day and at the time that the woman was raped. So if you think back to what I said about um, not relying solely on DNA, but on relying on other evidence as well, clearly in this case, if the prosecution had investigated the whereabouts of the twin brother, for example, it may have been a different outcome um, in that um, particular case. So um, in the South African setting, and I think as with mo in most other jurisdictions, um, DNA is used to um, identify a perpetrator. So for example, um, you would compare the DNA that was collected at the scene of the crime to someone who is in the database already, or to someone who has been um, arrested to identify somebody as potentially being the perpetrator of the crime. Um, you could use it to establish that there was some kind of prior contact with the suspect and the victim of the crime. Um, DNA can also be used um, in a situation to um, establish the identity of a victim, um, to infer common involvement of one person in a number of separate crimes. So, you know, you can have um, a situation where DNA is lifted at the scene, let's say in a number of rape cases, where um, a DNA um, uh, is collected from the victims of rapes and you find out that the profile is coming back consistent with having one perpetrator. So even if you don't have uh, an identified individual at the, that particular stage, you, law enforcement has some kind of indication that you are looking for one single perpetrator rather than multiple perpetrators. And so that can affect the course of the investigation. And then you can use um, DNA to confirm or to negate suspicion um, on a particular person. So a few years ago, had quite a horrendous case where um, a nine-month-old baby girl was um, was raped and suffered horrendous injuries. And um, obviously, she was only nine months old, so she could not um, identify um, her perpetrators. But suspicion fell on 14 men in the community, including the grandfather of the young baby. And... Um, hmm. 
as you can imagine, South African community was incensed at this very brutal crime against a tiny baby. But um, fortunately um, for the grandfather and for uh, a couple of the others who had been accused of that crime, DNA has completely exonerated them from having participated in the rape of the baby. And um, in, by the same token, DNA tests actually um, identified um, 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 certain individuals from that group of 14 as having been the perpetrators. So you can understand in the case where you're dealing with the rape of, 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 of a baby, the circumstances are a little bit different than when you were dealing with an, an adult, because with an adult in most rape cases, the issue of consent um, uh, becomes um, something that the um, accused relies on, um, because if there was consent, then they cannot be a rape. However, the fact that in this case of the little baby, the fact that um, the DNA of a certain of the accused was found um, in the vagina of the baby, I mean, uh, you know, in, in what logical universe would that be okay? Or would, that, would there be a reason for the semen of the um, um, accused to actually find their way, its way into the body of the baby. So clearly in the circumstances in, in, in that case made it um, possible for a um, conviction. And DNA evidence is very, very important in these kind of cases because in South Africa, as I've mentioned, um, there, um, you know, um, the rape statistics are very, very, very high. And in a lot of the cases, the victims of um, rapes are children. So, you know, you looking at children, um, there was a case um, um, that went to court a, a little while ago and you had a child that was about um, four or six months old. So you have very young children, you have um, um, four, five, six-year-olds, for example, who are the victims of rape. And when it comes to testifying in court proceedings, because of the age of these victims, some of them are too young to be able to verbalize what happened to them. In other words, they're not in a position to testify about what happened to them, or maybe they um, aren't in a position to be intelligible in court, or they aren't in a position to fully appreciate the court proceeding. So, you know, that adults have to take the oath where they have to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, help you God. And with um, children, like a young child of four, the child may not appreciate what taking the oath is about, or may not appreciate. Um, what it means to tell the truth, or what it means to tell a, a lie, and if the core, if the child is not in a position to appreciate this, then the child um, is not a competent witness. That means the child can't testify in these proceedings, and so you have then a situation where a child who is the victim and probably the only witness to the sexual assault or the rape that happened to her or him in that situation is prevented from testifying in court. And this is where the DNA evidence becomes um, um, so very important because, and this is where um, um, professionals like you who would have been collecting or analyzing the DNA sample will have to um, testify um, about the probability or the um, um, yeah the probability of that sample having come from the accused, for example, and so your testimony in that kind of case will be very very important because in a lot of cases your testimony, the testimony of the expert who is going to be talking about the DNA and so on, will be or could be that thing that actually convicts. Um, um, that convicts the accused. That may be the only evidence um, together with, um, you know, statements that were made and so on that may um, convict the um, accused in those kind of matters. Now, 
<clears throat> in um, South Africa, um, um, the previous speaker um, talked about the um, um, the fact that um, all those who are working at the um, laboratory, for example, would have to be tested, uh, would have um, their samples taken, and so on. Um, there are an, in in South Africa a number of different um, databases. And so all of um, those individuals who are working with the sample will have to provide a, um, or their profile will be on the database so that um, they can be excluded, for example, as being, um, um, if the sample shows up that um, um, their DNA is there and so on. So you have um, those, uh, those safeguards that are built into the system. Um, in South Africa, um, a DNA sample, a non-intimate DNA sample, and that would be um, something like a cheek swab. Um, that can be taken from a person who is a suspect or who has been arrested in connection with having committed a crime. No, no consent is required in that kind of situation. Um, so um, normally, if there's any kind of bodily sample that is taken from a suspect in South Africa, you have to have the consent of that person. But our DNA Act and our Criminal Procedure Act has dispensed with that where it is a non-intimate um, non sample, so not including semen, for example. So if it's just a cheek swab, which is what we use in South Africa um, in order to conduct our DNA tests, there's no consent required, so there's no reason why if a person is required in terms of the DNA Act or the Criminal Procedure Act to provide a sample, um, that that sample um, cannot, be, um, um, cannot be taken. Now, um, the one of the important things um, that um, needs to be um, considered by everyone who is working with these particular um, biological samples or the DNA samples is that the chain of custody um, with regard to that sample must always be um, maintained. So the integrity of the evidence has got to be guaranteed at all times. So um, for you um, who, so for example, the expert who is analyzing the sample and so on, um, you are going to have to, by the time it reaches you in the affidavit or in your testimony, you are going to, you uh, or the position in South Africa is that you have to um, uh, be able to explain to the court that you received the sample intact, that um, um, it was properly sealed, properly, um, you, you'd have, to, it would have had to be given to you by a particular person. And what would happen when you are dealing with these samples is that the integrity of the sample, the chain of custody must be maintained. So, from the time that the sample is collected at the scene of the crime. So if there's a, um, uh, a speck of blood that is collected at the scene of the crime, if there is um, an item of clothing that needs to be um, tested for the presence of DNA, all of these must be properly collected. So um, there, um, you, you would be familiar with the different methods of collecting samples. So when you are dealing with an item of clothing, for example, um, the fact, uh, you know, if there's blood or if there's semen on the piece of clothing, you don't store in plastic, but you would rather use a paper bag or, um, in order to protect the integrity of the sample, to make sure that there um, is no um, um, destruction of the sample and so on. So all that has got to be properly um, um, documented. And obviously, um, um, you are going to have to testify when it comes to court proceedings about whether the um, um, uh, item of evidence was properly sealed, whether it was properly stored, 
um, whether the person that handed in to you for testing was somebody who should have been in possession of that. So you have to make sure that uh, or one of the things that defense lawyers look at um, sometimes is not necessary the merits of the case. So they won't really sometimes look at whether um, um, the DNA sample in fact came from the accused or the perpetrator. Your results or your findings may not be as important as the fact of whether the chain of custody was maintained. So um, let's say for example, that there was an item of clothing, let's say an item of underwear that um, belonged to the victim, that was removed from the victim and later sent to the, um, um, to the labs for testing, that you performed the, D the D uh, necessary, necessary DNA test and your results show that the semen on the piece of underwear of the victim belongs to the accused. Okay, you're in a position to testify. The science is good, the procedure and so on is fine. Then the defense lawyer, somebody like me, comes along and says, hang on, that may have been the case, but um, the manner in which that was transported or um, it went from policeman number one to policeman number two. And then there's a break in the chain. We don't know what happened to it until it reached your laboratory. So if there's a break in the chain of custody, um, you can't guarantee the integrity or the reliability of that piece of evidence. So irrespective of the fact that it may link the accused person to the crime, to the rape that was committed in that kind of situation, because there was a break in the chain of custody, um, that would be problematic because how do we vouch for the integrity of the sample if it disappeared for three days by the time it left the position of policeman number two? until it arrived two days later at the laboratory for testing. And if we can't say for certain what happened to that piece of evidence in the two days that it went missing, then how can we say for certain that it wasn't tampered with, that it wasn't um, interfered with in some way? So sometimes, um, um, even though you have an expert who is testifying, with regard to identifying the, um, um, the accused in that case as the person whose bodily fluids are on that item of clothing. Um, because of the unreliability of the evidence, the court may decide not to admit that evidence. So the DNA evidence may be inadmissible because if we can't say for certain that nobody tampered with that evidence, then how can we say that the accused is guilty of that crime beyond reasonable doubt? So these would be some of the um, issues that, um, um, that um, as an expert, you may have to deal with or that you may come across while um, um, having to testify in court proceedings. Um, I do quite a lot of um, training for medical practitioners and other experts who may have to testify in court. And I think it's so important that the expert is aware when they have to testify in court proceedings um, that, um, um, you know, to, to expect certain things to happen so that you are not left um, as an expert when you have to testify, feeling out of your depth or feeling like you are being attacked by the defense lawyer. Um, it's the job of the defense lawyer to do that because um, he has to give his client the best possible defense in the circumstances. And so if that means attacking the integrity um, of the sample, that happens, okay? Sometimes, um, um, you may have a situation where your credentials um, um, as an expert 
um, may be questioned. So generally in all juris in most jurisdictions where you're dealing with expert witness testimony, um, your expertise has got to be in the field in which you are asked to testify. Um, and the court in South Africa definitely has an issue if somebody is an expert, but not necessarily in the field in which he's being asked to give his expertise in court proceedings. So for example, if you're a ballistics expert, um, you are an expert when it comes to talking about the trajectory of a bullet and that, and, and, and those kind of things. But it may not qualify you to be an expert in the field of DNA. So um, those are the uh, you know you have those kind of issues that um, um, that need to be taken into consideration as well. And another um, mistake that experts make sometimes, um, um, and we've seen it um, in courts in South Africa, especially where um, there's been testimony in. Um, cases of DNA. Um, I teach a lot of um, 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 classes that deal with sex crimes and the evidence involved in that kind of situation. And very often you see experts who testify and are not prepared to make concessions, who are not prepared to um, um, to accept that there may be an alternative theory or to accept an alternative explanation. And I think as an expert, um, um, you may be seen as having uh, bias um, in favor of the party that called you sometimes if you are unwilling to make certain concessions where they may be required. And I'm not saying that you have to agree with everything the opposing party says, it's just that if there's an alternative explanation, um, you should be able to um, make those concessions so that the court is in a position to actually take all these things into consideration. You would remember in the opening part of my talk, I talked about the fact that as an expert, your function is to assist the court in those areas of the law where the court does not have your kind of knowledge, your kind of training, your kind of expertise. And so by testifying as an expert in those kind of situations, what you are doing is basically helping um, or assisting the court to um, um, understand those issues, to draw certain conclusions. Of course, um, in South Africa, when you are an expert witness, the court is not uh, compelled or bound to accept or rely on your evidence. At the end of the day, the judge is the boss of his courtroom. So he can completely be, follow um, uh, the argument that you've made, or he can disregard it as he feels. Because remember, in determining how much of weight to give to your evidence, the judge also has to take into consideration all the other pieces of evidence um, in that matter in order to reach a um, um, conclusion. Um, so <clears throat> when it comes to, um, I've talked about some of the issues that you may face in court proceedings if you are testifying about um, um, these kind of issues. Um, laboratory performance is also something that um, can be brought up by the um, um, defense counsel um, in criminal court proceedings. Um, sometimes um, you may be questioned about issues of quality control in your laboratory setup um, with regard to the um, uh, your monitoring procedures, with regard to um, how you would um, uh, deal with verification of your results, with the documenting of your findings, with the performance of your laboratory. So as I mentioned, sometimes the issues that may be dealt with um, by a defense attorney um, in 
um, cross-examining you and here I'm working on, on the assumption that you are a prosecution witness as opposed to a defense witness. So irrespective of your conclusions in that particular case, um, quality control issues, specifically with regard to the functioning of your laboratory and the processes and procedures that you adopt in your laboratory may be things that you may be um, questioned on. So in preparing you to be a witness in these kind of proceedings, so say for example, you are a DNA expert who's having to testify in court proceedings. As I've mentioned, you may not only be um, questioned or uh, cross-examined by the opposing side on your findings per se, you may also be questioned on things like, as I indicated, chain of custody issues. You may be questioned on things like the quality control um, based on some of, uh, you know, uh, I've um, talk, uh, spoken about some of those issues um, with regard to um, um, documenting and monitoring and, and those kind of things. So you may be questioned with regard to um, what kind of um, monitoring is done, how do you deal with the documenting of your um, findings and so on, and also whether, um, uh, what kind of accreditation. Um, in South Africa, um, all the um, biological samples or all the uh, forensic evidence that is collected um, in a particular case is tested um, at the um, South African Police Services Forensic Sciences Laboratory. Um, that laboratory is um, um, is not a is not is not an accredited laboratory, but the Forensic Sciences Laboratory refers to its own quality system in court, um, um, and its own systems are not. Um, 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 are not to, uh, set to national standards, but our courts have accepted um, the standards or the quality system that the police's forensics, uh, forensic laboratory, uh, forensic sciences laboratory um, um, complies with. Um, there was a case in South Africa, it was a rape case, um, and um, the um, um, DNA evidence was challenged by the defense. And one of the issues that the defense raised numerous times was that the um, laboratory was not accredited. And at the time that that case um, got before the court, um, members of the Forensic Sciences Laboratory who testified indicated that the Forensic Sciences Laboratory was not looking to be accredited at any time in the future. And so the defense tried to get the DNA results thrown out of court. Um, and that was the DNA um, 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 evidence was very strongly indicative in that case, together with the other evidence of the accused guilt with regard to the um, rape, uh, to the rape charge. And so the defense tried to get the court to um, um, dis disregard the DNA evidence as being unreliable and therefore irrelevant to the court proceedings. And in South Africa, if evidence is irrelevant, then it's not considered, it's not eval taken into the evaluation and the determination of the um, guilt of the accused. And so the court had to consider how important was the accreditation of the Forensic Sciences Laboratory? And the court heard testimony um, about the quality system that the Forensic Sciences Laboratory followed in testing all the samples that were given and so on. And the court found that based on the protocols and the procedures um, um, that were put in place at the Forensic Sciences Laboratory with regard to the quality system and the testing and the procedures that were followed, there was nothing to indicate that the findings would have been um, unreliable. And so the court um, didn't accept the defense's claim that because it was not an accredited laboratory, that the findings of the court, oh, sorry, that the findings of the laboratory were not um, um, were not reliable. Now, 
with regard to um, to um, DNA um, evidence, um, you know, um, with the advances that have been made since DNA was first used, and the fact that um, um, a number of um, countries um, um, have uh, now committed to establishing uh, DNA databases for cross-referencing, uh, for referencing purposes that you have, um, um, like in South Africa, you have the different indices, you have the convicted um, persons index, you have um, the index where a person is just sus a suspect or somebody who's awaiting trial and so on. Um, um, it becomes easier, I think, um, the larger your databases are to be able to make use of them as a tool with regard to identification purposes and so on. Um, we've seen um, in a number of cases, especially where identity is um, an issue, for example, the use of mitochondrial DNA to be able to establish, um, uh, to confirm identity um, together with other circumstantial evidence, um, obviously. Um, just the other day, I was reading about a case um, where genetic genealogy was used. Um, um, a woman was killed, I think, in 1970, if I remember correctly, and her murderer was never found. And um, um, using the um, um, uh, family family DNA um, database, I can't think of the actual name of it now, forgive me for that. Um, they were able to trace the DNA of the perpetrator to a family member um, who was in this um, ancestral DNA database. And um, investigation then indicated that um, either the brother or the stepbrother of the person that was in the in the in the database um, um, was seen in proximity to the woman who was murdered. Um, they exhumed his body. Um, he died a year or two previously, so they exhumed his body and tested. Um, um, and took a DNA sample from him and tested it against the sample that they'd found on the woman in 1970. And um, um, he was identified as being the person who had raped the woman in that case. So obviously there's um, the applications that one can use when it comes to DNA evidence and DNA analysis. Um, is very very important and has can have huge repercussions for um, um, for um, crime solving and in order um, for the criminal justice system to work properly. Um, when you are dealing with DNA evidence, you have a little bit of a paradox because the perception seems to be that science has the um, ability to be universally accepted. Um, to give um, very clear, very authoritative resolutions. And this is the major attraction for the criminal justice system when it comes to relying on forensic evidence. And in the past 20, 30 years, you would know that not just with regard to DNA evidence, but there's been a lot more reliance on making use of um, um, forensic evidence. In fact, um, um, so much so that um, my university is one of the first or one of the only universities to have introduced um, a module specifically on forensic evidence, which I teach, to equip um, new lawyers um, with some kind of idea of some of the scientific, um, forensic scientific principles that they may encounter that need, they need to familiarize themselves um, with regard to um, um, forensic uh, forensic science, um, and for you as um, as scientists, um, you know you think about your role in the criminal justice system, and your role is not just to test um, samples and to testify in court proceedings, because legal practitioners 
um, generally don't have the kind of specific knowledge with regard to the various fields of forensic science. It becomes necessary for um, a prosecutor, for example, or a defense attorney to obtain advice from an expert with regard to a specific legal question. So you may have a prosecutor who wants to prosecute a certain matter, who may um, 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 get in contact with a forensic scientist in a specific field to say, um, for example, this is the case that we're dealing with. Can you suggest any way that we can get evidence, the evidence that we, are de uh, that, that, that we require? Because law enforcement, um, um, legal representatives may not know or um, about what's at the forefront of your particular field, may not be aware of cutting edge technology, new technology that may have been indicated. So you as a forensic scientist also have, has a, um, a very important role to play in the criminal justice system. Even if it just means just advising a legal, um, a legal practitioner that um, what he's trying to do does not make any, what he's trying to do with the evidence um, does not stand up to scientific scrutiny or that a line of questioning is flawed. Because in addition to wanting to so secure um, a conviction, we also have to make sure in the court system that justice is served. So it's not a good idea and lawyers have to be um, warned against pursuing something that may not be scientifically sound, that may not necessarily um, um, be relied on. You know, you may have a theory that one of the um, lawyers wants to put forward to the court that is seen as a joke in your field of expertise. So it may be some crackpot that's come out with a theory that someone um, that he's read about in some scientific journal and he consults you and you say to him, please don't go there because that person is a joke um, in our profession, that there's no, uh, the, the, the reasoning that he's used is flawed or whatever. So you would be in a position to advise legal practitioners with regard to maintaining that, uh, with regard to following a line of questioning that um, um, ensures that justice is done the end of the day because it's not just about getting a conviction it's also about ensuring that there is justice and fairness towards the um um, um the accused the judge's dilemma in these kind of situations um obviously the reason for expert evidence is um um not to decide for the court whether somebody is guilty or not but actually to assist the court to determine um, um, these particular issues as they pertain to the evaluation of the evidence. Um, um, obviously, if a judge ex um, accepts the evidence of a forensic scientist, um, and um, as often, often happens in cases involving DNA, um, the results have to be interpreted by the um, expert. Um, and I think that all parties involved in this kind of situation have to be mindful that there is always room for human error. Um, um, there may be an unconscious bias or very conscious bias that comes out um, in some kinds of situations. And also as an expert, as I've mentioned, you need to be mindful of an alternative interpretation that may be um, um, that you may have to consider in those kind of circumstances. Um, at the end of the day, as an expert witness, um, your role is to assist the court, and the role of the court is to ensure that justice is done. And so, um, obviously, um, your role here is crucial. Um, as I've mentioned, especially in cases where you are dealing with victims, um, either deceased or who are children, who are not in a position to have their voices heard in court proceedings, where the DNA evidence um, can um, um, 
can provide a voice for the victim in that situation. Clearly, your role in court proceedings is very, very important. So I thank you for giving me your time. Um, I hope you found my talk um, informative. And if there are any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your valuable informative session. Actually, I have a question. Um, and what are the documents required for a case involving DNA analysis? Um, so, uh, sorry, if you can ask again, please. Okay, ma'am. Uh, what are the documents that are required or that are necessary for a case that involves DNA analysis or DNA as evidence? <laughs> okay, so in South Africa, what would um, normally happen is that um, the expert who is, um, or the person who is analyzing the DNA would depose to an affidavit um, in which they would um, then um, set out um, basically step by step. Um, okay, so they start off with um, giving their credentials in order to establish them as, uh, as an expert in that particular field, because without establishing expert then you are without establishing yourself as an expert you are just a lay person and the opinion evidence of a lay person is inadmissible in court proceedings so once you've established your expertise you would indicate um, how the evidence came to um, um, came to be um, dealt with by you so you would be uh, indicating for the purposes of establishing chain of custody, when, where, and who handed that to you. You would give an indication that the exhibit was sealed, that you broke the seal in order to um, 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 conduct your analysis. And that just establishes that the chain of custody is intact. Then you would have to um, 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 indicate the process, the procedure that you followed in order to have that uh, tested, um, in order to conduct your tests and so on. And then obviously your conclusions and the reason why you have reached your conclusions. And you would submit that affidavit into court together with any other documents that you relied on and that you would use, which would form um, annexures to the affidavit where necessary. And then if there's an issue with your evidence, then you will be required to give oral evidence where you can be submitted to cross-examination. So in South Africa, that would be the manner in which we would deal with expert evidence. Okay, thank you. Ma'am, one more question uh, I mm -hmm. have for you. Ma'am, uh, since DNA is like a very reliable technique and as a evidence, it is very accurate and uh, the result is very certain. But why it is used in a corroborative evidence, not as a like a single evidence uh, on, uh, on which the whole proceedings can be like uh, uh, decided? And why it is used as a corroborative evidence? Okay, I think. Um, um, for um, our purposes um, in, in, in a court of law, um, it's very, very accurate, very, very reliable with regard to identifying a person as having come into contact or having deposited his DNA. But, you know, um, um, there can be so many reasons why. So, for example, if, I, um, if I'm sitting next to you, um, and um, a piece of my hair with the root um, falls onto your, um, your jacket. It doesn't necessarily mean that I was the one who killed you. All that it shows is that I came into contact with you because we may have been sitting together on a bus or in a restaurant and I left some of my DNA on you. Now, if we relied only on the, on the fact that my hair is on your person, um, I may be convicted without ever having had any malicious thought or action towards you. But we look at corroborating or other evidence to be able to, because, you know, I, I, would, I would say if you charge me with that crime, but I never had anything to do with it. Um, where the onus of proof is on the prosecution. And by that, I mean the prosecution has to show beyond reasonable doubt that I was the person that killed you. 
all that is showing is that when they prosecute me is that I came into contact with you because they say you killed because your hair is on her. And I say, but we had lunch together. And after lunch, I left and she went and I don't know what happened after that. So you need, if they are going to show that I killed you beyond reasonable doubt, they have to give some other evidence other than my explanation and my totally legitimate explanation of how my DNA came to be on you. So they must have an eyewitness, for example, that saw me killing you or somebody that saw us fighting or somebody that knows that I was having an affair with your husband and so I had a reason to kill you. Or, so it would be those kind of things that would, have, that would be taken into account to show beyond reasonable doubt that I killed you. Just the DNA in itself, in the example that I gave you, would not be sufficient. Yes, it would identify me, as having come into contact with you because there probably is nobody else that has the same DNA on me. So my DNA is on you for a reason. And my explanation is that I touched you, but I didn't necessarily kill you. So with regard to um, in a court of law, there's a number of elements, a number of parts that together make up a crime. So each one of those elements has to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. So for murder, for example, it's the unlawful, intentional killing of another human being. We know that you've been killed and we know that you're a human being, but there's nothing to show that I was the person who unlawfully and intentionally killed you. There's got to be something else that proves. So an eyewitness basically will be able to say, but I saw her doing it, or I have video footage of her doing it. And that will show that I intentionally killed you, unlawfully intentionally killed you. So besides the DNA evidence that is on you, um, there has to be other corroborating or other evidence that um, proves um, the crime. I hope that made sense. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for clearing my doubt. Yes. Okay. So, anyone uh, like want to ask any any questions to ma'am? Um, yeah, I just wanted to know something. Um, yeah. So, in case of cold cases, how does it happen that after so many years, just randomly some case pops up, or like, what is the procedure? Does it depend upon the police or uh, experts, or how does that happen? Okay, thank you for that um, question. Right, so you know that um, uh, that um, DNA, um, if it's um, if your sample is properly stored and and so on, um, can survive a number of years. And with some of the um, the cold cases, you have, for example, um, let, let's stay with, with just straightforward DNA testing. In the 1970s, we didn't have DNA testing. Yeah. Um, and then we had this whole, in the 1980, late 80s, 1990s, you had this very big upsurge with regard to a number of cases um, um, where DNA testing was used. And so you have the um, biological samples that may have been retained from the earlier cases, um, somebody, let's say, um, you find this very often in the United States, where um, um, you have people, especially with rape cases, where um, people have very long sentences, like life sentences, or even the death penalty, based on eyewitness testimony. So in other words, the, um, the victim, for example, says, I know it was Mr. X, Mr. X was the person that raped me. And Mr. X says, never, could never be in this and that. But based on eyewitness testimony, and like 20, 30 years ago, eyewitness testimony was given huge reliance in court cases. We know now that eyewitness testimony is not so reliable. And that's why we rely on, in addition to eyewitness testimony, we rely on forensic evidence to actually um, 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 strengthen the eyewitness testimony or discount the eyewitness testimony completely. And there have been a number of cases where a person was convicted um, and found guilty and sentenced to, um, to die or even to long periods of imprisonment. Um, and then um, with the advent of um, DNA testing, 
They've now asked that their cases be reheard or that DNA testing is um, conducted in order to do that. And there've been a number of cases where um, um, accused persons or convicted persons have actually been exonerated based on the DNA evidence. Um, it would, um, in, in, in those kind of cases, the person who's sitting in jail basically um, approaches the court um, 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 so that the court orders DNA testing, you can have that. Um, in some cases, the police may be in, continue the investigation or new evidence may pop up where they go back to a cold case. So you may have a situation where the case goes cold because there's, there's DNA, but um, the DNA doesn't match anybody in the databases and you don't have a suspect that you can compare the DNA with. So it just sits, the profile just sits. And then let's say you have a situation where um, um, in the course of investigation or you get information that um, let's say Mr. M Mr. A um, was the perpetrator. So then you can get a sample from Mr. A and test it against that. And that's how you revive the cold case again, because then once you've tested Mr. A, it then matches up with the case from 20 years ago that has the unidentified DNA. Because remember, if that DNA was properly stored, properly preserved and so on, it's not going to change over time. Mr. Yeah. A has the same DNA from the time he was born to after he died. So that's not going to change. And so you have new circumstances or an investigation that goes in a different way where the DNA can then be used. You can just then have the DNA tested to have a match to somebody, um, you know, once you've identified somebody or somebody shows up in the database for having committed some other crime, and then you get a match from this unidentified sample that's been um, entered into the DNA database that suddenly matches with somebody that is identified from having committed another crime. So that could be um, that could be something as well. Okay. Right. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? Hello. Yes. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for such an informative lecture. I want to know that the, there is a case you said that there was two twins where the fingerprint can be an evidence to differentiate between them. Is there any other evidence except fingerprint? Um, look, with regard to um, identification, I think um, fingerprints and DNA are the two most important um, tools that you have at your disposal. Um, DNA, because generally nobody else but your identical twin will have the same DNA as you. And then fingerprints from the sense, from the point of view that um, um, there are no two people generally that have exactly the same fingerprint. So um, um, I'm just trying to think of what else could give you that kind of um, um, discerning. No, there's not anything that I can think of um, offhand with regard to um, um, a, an identifier in that situation. You know, of course, why eyewitness testimony may be notoriously um, um, unreliable because you know we can change our eye color with colored contact lenses we can change our hair color um, change the way that we look with plastic surgery and so on generally your fingerprints um, will remain yours for life um, your fingerprints do wear with time or if you're working in certain types of jobs you may have the um, pattern of your fingerprint that wears down and becomes not as um, um, the loops and whorls, for example, may fade a little bit, but you still retain your fingerprint. And of course, I've said your DNA remains yours, even though you manage to change your appearance, the way you look, your hair color and so on. So those two would be from the point of view of um, um, being unchanging, um, even though physical appearance and so on may change. Um, those would be the most reliable. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. Any further questions? 
बकवास मारा थैंक यू मैम नो थैंक यू लेडीज एंड जेंटल थैंक यू सो मच मैम फॉर योर वैल्यूबल एंड इन्फॉर्मेटिव सेशन एज दी एंड टूडेज इवेंट आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक यू ऑल फॉर ज्वाइनिंग द कॉन्फ्रेंस योर प्रेजेंस टूडे शोज अ स्ट्रॉन्ग कमिटमेंट टू वर्क in particular i would like to express my sincere thank gratitude you very much okay. to the speakers for sharing their expertise with all of us their presence helped to make this event a great success at last forensic dot india wishes you all the best and hope that you continue to be engaged with us for more upcoming events once again thank you all thank you so much take care bye bye Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.